What is up, everybody? This is your boy, Taryn Rodriguez, bringing you another edition of Set Point. And honestly, this is actually the last week of the NCAA volleyball season. I'm not kidding you, honestly. Why? Because we have two, yes, two NCAA volleyball tournaments going on. We have the NCAA Beach Tournament that's going to be happening this weekend. We've got the NCAA Men's Volleyball Tournament. And we had the first round matchup conclude as Penn State downed Belmont Abbey. How did the Nittany Lions take down the Crusaders? And what went right for the Nittany Lions? And like I said, we have NCAA Beach Volleyball happening as the top eight teams in the NCAA tournament have been released. And it's only an eight-team bracket this year. So we only have eight teams. And remember, we still have the contenders bracket, but I'm going to be breaking down the top eight teams and which teams have the best chance of winning the NCAA tournament on the beach side and which teams will most likely fall short. Also... Got a little bit of a recap in regards to the NCAA Beach Volleyball tournaments that happened, such as Big West Conference, Pac-12, you get the bill. All that and more here on Set Point. This is Taryn Rodriguez bringing you another edition of Set Point here on iSports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. And welcome one, welcome all to another edition of Set Point. Thank you all for tuning in on this beautiful Monday afternoon. Yes, unfortunately, it is Monday and and not Tuesday, so I have bounced around yet again. So it is what it is. I, my schedule, unfortunately, had to go to Monday for this week and not Tuesday. And for those wondering, I do apologize if I didn't. Uh, go live for the SoCal Supreme Sports Show this past Friday. There was a lot going on, but I will be back this upcoming Friday. So I already got Adam Karnick in the chat room saying, hello, Taryn, have a great show. Bump, set, spike. Hey, thank you, Adam. Adam just got done with his show, Shy town Weekly, where he talked about the Chicago Bears draft, and he talked a little, just a little Chicago White Sox news. And he also talked about the drafts from the Detroit Lions, the Minnesota Vikings, and the Green Bay Packers. But he mainly just talked about the Bears and how they did a great job with their draft and whatnot. So thank you for passing the baton off to me, Adam. And I appreciate it. And he says, I like having you on Monday. Makes it a lot easier to catch your show. Hey, hey, it is what it is. And uh, I got to do what I got to do. And it, I, I'm happy to have you in the chat room, my man. So thank you for tuning in, and thank you for passing the baton off to me. Without any further delay, let's get on into some volleyball action. But first, we have the sponsors from iSports Radio to go over. The first one being Legacy Financial. Financial. 2020 was a tough year. However, staying positive, keeping your faith, and continuing to work hard is the goal. If you're in a financial struggle at the moment, you're doing well and you want to get to the next level, or you're looking for a new opportunity to work for yourself and earn more money part-time, give Iowa a call at 510-928-2104. That number again is 510-928-2104 to book your appointment today. Io and her husband, Andrew, are just two people on a mission to help families build a legacy. Because everyone in their life needs a legacy, whether you're 4 years old or you're 64 years old. And you could follow Legacy Financial on Twitter at Legacy underscore Uncut. And you could follow Legacy Financial on Instagram at Sims underscore Uncut. And if you go to, if you're on Facebook, just go to the search bar and type up Legacy, then the word Financial. You'll get them on Facebook as well. And then the second sponsor for iSports Radio is the Southern California Warriors Semi-Pro Football Team. The world of semi-pro sports is unlike any other sports organizations. Players pay to play in hopes of so many outcomes, whether it's playing to get film to try out for professional teams, big-time colleges, or playing to just stay in shape. No matter what, all semi-pro players have one thing in common, that's 
playing for the love of their game. The SoCal Warriors have been on a quest to earn titles and give players second chances since 2017. Whether you're in Southern California or anywhere in the world, give semi-pro sports a chance if you love your sport. You may get that second chance you have been waiting for as an athlete. You can follow SoCal Warriors on Twitter, at SoCal Warriors, on Instagram, at so Southern California underscore Warriors, and you can follow them on Facebook by typing the word Southern, then the word California, then the word Warriors. So thank you to our two sponsors for being the official sponsors of iSports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. As we say hello to Courtney Harden in the chat room, thank you for tuning in, my good friend. He had himself a great show on BS3 Radio this past Saturday as he had his show, The Real Deal, as he talks about all sorts of things, such as sports and other things in life. He does a great job with his show, and he also has uh, Instagram Live interviews with all these amazing people. I've been a guest on on The Real Deal, and Courtney Harden is indeed The Real Deal. So he, when it comes to Spreaker, though, he normally goes live every Saturday morning, if you're on the Pacific or West Coast. Um... If you're on the East Coast, he goes live early afternoon and whatnot. So definitely do check out The Real Deal with Courtney Harden and all the other shows on BS3 Radio. So there's that. Without any further delay, let's get on in to some volleyball action because it's, it is that time, y'all. I can't believe this is the last week of the NCAA volleyball season. It's the last full week of competition because next week is going to be like a recap show of the NCAA Beach Volleyball Tournament and then the NCAA Men's Volleyball Tournament, and then that's it. No NCAA Volleyball stuff until August. I think August. August or September, barring everything doesn't go haywire. But this is the last full week of the NCAA Volleyball season. Where's the time gone? Anyway, let's jump to some NCAA Men's Volleyball news. Or the NCAA Men's Volleyball Tournament, starting with with uh, their bracket. So... It's a seven-team tournament. Two teams have, like I, like I mentioned last week, have a uh, have buys to the semifinals, and Hawaii and BYU are the top two seeds, and they have buys until the semifinals. UC Santa Barbara, Pepperdine, and Lewis have a first-round buy, so they get a first-round buy. UC Santa Barbara and Pepperdine have already been finalized to facing one another in the second round, while Lewis will play the winner of Penn State and Belmont Abbey, who played today in the opening round of the NCAA tournament. And it's only one opening round match, so I don't know if Penn State and Belmont... I mean, when it came to the rankings... Belmont Abbey and Penn State of the seven teams that made the NCAA tournament were the lowest of the low when it come when it came to these teams. So so uh Penn State and Belmont Abbey were their conference champion representative and they automatically got to go into the NCAA tournament. The problem was is that they didn't really have too many standout wins to make up for why they should have been seated higher. So, in this matchup, this pitted Penn State, who is familiar when it comes to the NCAA tournament, versus Belmont Abbey, who hasn't really been in the NCAA tournament. I want to say this is like their first ever NCAA tournament appearance. I'm not entirely sure, but it kind of showed in the match. So, the first set between Belmont Abbey and Penn State. Belmont Abbey actually started a little slow, but then they progressively got better. I'm very surprised that the Conference Carolinas champion actually gave the EIVA champion a little run for their money. Penn State entered today with a 21-3 and record. Its only three losses were to Ohio State, which is outside of their conference, and then they, the other two losses were to NJIT, which, which, which is in their conference, which had a phenomenal season. Unfortunately, they fell in the semifinals of the EIVA tournament. But it was very tight in the, in the first set as... Penn State really could not pull away as they only led by as many as two until the late stages of the set where they led 24 to 21. Belmont Abbey did save one set point, but Penn State took the first set 25 to 22. Penn State 
hit 364 while Belmont Abbey hit 375. I'm very surprised Belmont Abbey hit, had such a high hitting percentage, but unfortunately dropped that set. It just goes to show you that your level of errors against a team like Penn State cannot be high. Otherwise, you're w- going to wind up losing. So the second set was very one-sided. Like there was only one tie and, as opposed to set one, which had five ties. But Penn State pretty much dominated Belmont Abbey in that first or in that second set as Penn State took set number two, 25 to 13. Penn State hit 533 in that in that set. In other words, they hit over they had a 50% of their uh kills uh, as a po- as opposed to their hit as opposed to their hitting attempts were basically high. They only had 9 kills that set, but th- it was pretty high. It, but it, they had other ways of they had other methods of scoring points. Meanwhile for Belmont Abbey they did not do well in that second set. The Crusaders only hit they hit negative point thirty yeah, negative point forty three, and they had nine kill nine hitting errors as opposed to eight kills on twenty three attempts. Like Belmont Abbey really struggled. And then Penn State just really outworked them, especially when it came to serves. Like the serves were really what killed Belmont Abbey. I'll get to that in a little bit, but set three was pretty much Penn State started off the third set strong, and they never looked back as there were no ties and no lead changes. Matter of fact, I need to, I do need to make note of this. Penn State never trailed at one point in the match against Belmont Abbey. That just goes to show you the experience level between the Nittany Lions and the Crusaders. And you can't really blame Belmont Abbey for coming out flat against a team like Penn State. Like, Penn State has some studs on that team. I will just say that right now. And then this is pretty much uncharted territory for the Crusaders. So, in the end, Penn State took the third set 25-19 to and won the match 3 to nothing. So, it was a clean sweep. By the way, these uh, matches, or the whole NCAA tournament, is taking place in the Covell the Covelli Center in Columbus, Ohio. So basically, Ohio State is the host of the NCAA Men's Volleyball Tournament. See what I did there? The host of the NCAA Men's Volleyball Tournament. (laughs) (laughs) I crack myself up. But Penn State just dominated. This was no surprise. I knew Penn State was going to win, but they... And I knew they were going to win in straight sets. The only thing that kind of surprised me was that Belmont Abbey really pushed them in that first set. As for the whole match, and when it comes to individual stats, Penn State was led by Cal Fisher, who had 10 kills, only one hitting error, and he hit 563. Brett Wildman had 9 kills, only 2 hitting errors for a hitting percentage of 438. And then McCall Cowell had 7 kills, 0 hitting errors, 13 attempts for a hitting percentage of 538. As a team, Penn State only had four hitting errors throughout the entire match. And as a team, Penn State hit 509. In other words, they 50% of their kills were actually uh actually hit the floor and compared to their attempts. Like they had 57 attempts and then they had 33 kills. So they hit over 50%. It's like it's like hitting a jump shot in uh the NBA. It's like a field goal percentage. Like the higher your field goal percentage, the higher the better your team did. Adam says, "I don't get the Ohio State University stuff." We get it. You're Ohio State. Move on. Uh I was just making a pun, you know, just cuz they like to hold they like the to do the whole the stuff, but yeah, I I I I get it, Adam. I get what you mean, buddy. <laughs> So, in terms of assists, Cole Bogner had 30 assists for Penn State. Now, this was, now this next category is what Penn State dominated. They dominated dominated in service aces. They had 11 service aces on the night. Well, evening. You know what I mean. Brett Wildman had four service aces. Fisher had three service aces. Sam Marsh had two service aces. And McCall Cowell had two service aces as well. Now blocks that Penn State didn't really block the ball all that well just because Belmont Abbey didn't get 
didn't hit the ball that well. Either their hits were into the net, or they just were not ready for the block. As Penn State had one solo block, and then they had two block assists, totaling out to four team blocks. And then Penn State didn't dig the ball all that much because, again, they didn't. Again, they didn't have to dig to a whole lot because. Belmont Abbey couldn't get the ball over the net or through the block as Cole Bogner led Penn State in digs with four with four digs. That's how and then as a team, Penn State only had fifteen digs. So there's that. And like I said, Penn State hit five oh nine. They hit six fifty in set number three, which is mind blowing. Again, it when you're when you only have four hitting errors, you're doing something good. So and that just goes to show you how how amazing Penn State is and how much more experience that team has. As opposed to Belmont Abbey, they had 10 kills from Andrew Kohut, but he only hit 87. Matteo Maselli had 9 kills, 3 hitting errors, 19 attempts for a hitting percentage of 316. He was the one that probably stood out the most. Brian Long had 6 kills, only 3 or three errors, and he hit 300, but he only had 10 swings. Like, Belmont Abbey only had 30 kills, and Kohut, Maselli, and Long were their kill leaders for the most part. Everyone else had three or lower kills. In terms of assists, Breenan Davis had 28, ass- 28 assists. In terms of service aces, the Crusaders had five aces, with Long having two. Brandon Prizwaya having one. Matteo Maselli having one, and William Morris having one. Belmont Abbey missed 12 serves, as Penn State also missed 15 serves. And then in terms of blocks, Belmont Abbey only had one solo stuff and two block assists for a grand total of two blocks as a team. And then Belmont Abbey only had 19 digs. Six of them went to Daniel Sirkua and Andrew Kohut. And then that was pretty much it. So... And as a team, Belmont Abbey only hit 185. That's very low. So, again, this just goes to show you the level of experience and the level of talent both teams have. Like, the Coastal Carolinas Conference is not... It's not like the Big West Conference. It's not like the Mountain Pacific Sports Federation Conference. It's not like the EIVA, and it's not like the MIVA. It's It's not like... It's probably the bottom of the totem pole, in my honest opinion. I'm not trying to diss the Conference Carolinas Conference, but it's just not up there. And it also doesn't help that Belmont Abbey couldn't schedule stiffer competition. It couldn't schedule like the big-time opponents like Long Beach State or Hawaii or BYU or UCLA or any of those other top-10 teams. So it's tough to win a match when you don't have a whole lot of, like, proper experience and you don't and you're not battle tested enough so i really do feel bad for belmont abbey their first ncaa tournament appearance if that it just so happens to be resulted in probably a very sour showing so but they tried we can't fault them for trying on obviously but again you gotta if you're a first timer you gotta play at a high level, no matter who you're facing, unless that opponent is on your level. So there's that. So now we are down to just six teams in the NCAA men's volleyball tournament. So Penn State advances to play number three seed Lewis as the Nittany Lions were the number six seed and Lewis is the number three seed. If we're actually doing national seedings, there are only two national seedings theoretically, but since there are seven teams, I might as well just give everybody the proper seed. UC Santa Barbara, like I said, the supposed number four seed will face Pepperdine, the supposed number five seed in the other side of the bracket as the Gauchos won the Big West Conference Tournament while Pepperdine finished the runner-up in the Mountain Pacific Sports Federation Conference. The Lewis-Penn State matchup is very interesting. I think Penn State can give Lewis a run for their money just because even though Lewis has only lost twice, I think Lewis has been somewhat inconsistent. They have two losses to Ohio State and they haven't really beaten the 
greatest of all competition. Penn State at least has experienced failure, or not failure, uh, losing, and they have kind of had that, they've kind of been battle-tested as NJIT kind of was like their, pretty much their big-time rival, and I think that, I think if NJIT had made the finals of the EIVA tournament, I think it's a whole different tournament final between NJIT and Penn State. But unfortunately, NJIT lost to George Mason, and George Mason was just not up there in terms of talent. So there's that right there. So the winner of Lewis, Penn State, gets to face BYU. If I had to say, I'd probably say Lewis wins. I don't think it's going to be an easy win, though. I think Lewis is going to have to work for this win. Like, they've been coasting through the entire season. They have... They've had a couple matches where they've almost lost, but they unfortunately couldn't. They unfortunately pulled victory from the jaws of defeat. And then I think Penn State has had has been pretty consistent for the most part. I will say this: it wouldn't shock me if Penn State wins tomorrow, but I think Lewis is going to have to work for this win, just because Penn State is not that bad. I think they're a very solid club, and if Lewis wants to make it to the semifinals, they gotta, they gotta play pretty much perfect volleyball. Because I've seen Lewis's inconsistencies, and I don't think they are the most perfect volleyball team. Like, Lewis has their flaws, that's for sure. And last year, believe it or not, Penn State actually was one of the few teams that beat Lewis, so... I know Lewis has Ryan Conan on their team, but it doesn't mean that Lewis is invincible. I think Penn State has great defense, and if they serve like they did today, and they have the same game that they had today, which I highly doubt, I think the the Nittany Lions could pull off an upset. But I don't see Lewis losing. Like I think Lewis is going to have to grind it out. I think they grind it out in four sets. If they have to go five, they have to go five, but I think Lewis is going to really have to grind it out. I don't think it's going to end in a sweep. The only thing that would really shock me is if is if one of the teams pulls off a sweep, but I don't think it'll end in a sweep, considering Penn State is really good, and then Lewis is just as good, but it it for Penn State in order to win, they gotta pass the ball well, they gotta serve well, and they gotta watch out for Lewis's block because Lewis blocks the ball really well as well, and and they have to do everything they can to try to slow down Ryan Conan. So there's that. So as for the other s- s- quarterfinal that was set in stone, UC Santa Barbara plays Pepperdine. This is the the first meeting between these two teams as both these teams were unable to schedule non-conference games just because California restrictions and whatnot. So UC Santa Barbara is has probably their best team in probably team history. The Gauchos, if there's is a year for them to win the NCAA tournament, this has to be the year because this is probably their once in a lifetime team because they were able to beat Long Beach State, which really unfortunately grinds my gears. But UC Santa Barbara is stacked with talent. They have had some consistencies at the libero position, but I think they've gotten their libero position back on track and whatnot. So I think that UC Santa Barbara is going to need to continue their winning ways, and they have to. The thing that worries me for for, uh, Santa Barbara is that they're on the path of Hawaii, and they're 0-3 against the Rainbow Warriors. But for the Gauchos, they can't look that far ahead to Hawaii. They gotta get past a very tough Pepperdine team, which beat the number two seed UCLA in the MPSF tournament semifinals. And I will say this, if Pepperdine didn't beat UCLA, I think UCLA would have been in the NCAA tournament and not Pepperdine. So, Pepperdine's gotta be thanking its lucky stars that pulled off that win, otherwise they'd be at home and UCLA would be facing the Gauchos. So, what do I think for Pepperdine and UC Santa Barbara? Well, for starters, 
UC Santa Barbara is kind of like the Chicago Cubs of NCAA men's volleyball, as they have not made it to the NCAA tournament, and they have not won in... Well, they haven't made it to the NCAA tournament since 2011, and then they also haven't won an NCAA men's volleyball championship. So... For the Gauchos, this is kind of like a once in a lifetime opportunity. They it's going to be their talent versus Pepperdine's experience. I think Pepperdine is also going to be really good considering Bryce Dvorak has done a great job running the Waves' offense. And he's only a freshman. He was just recently named the AVCA newcomer of the year and whatnot. So, honestly, I think Pepperdine is not going to be an easy matchup for the Gauchos, but I think UC Santa Barbara, to me, if they want to win, is they got to be on their A game. They can't have another Long Beach State game. And they also, like I said, neither team can look cannot look ahead because, and this isn't the opportunity of whoever wins gets to lose to Hawaii. Like, no one should ever think that way. I think for Pepperdine... Their key to victory is they just got to run their offense smoothly. They have the setter to do so. And I think, to me, Pepperdine has a lot of options. They have a young team, but I think they they have a lot of NCAA tournament experience. And they have experience on their team quite a bit. Whereas UC Santa Barbara is making its first ever appearance. Well, not first ever appearance, but their first appearance this first ever appearance this decade, and they haven't made the NCAA men's volleyball tournament since 2011. It's been that long for the Gauchos. So this has been like a long time coming for UC Santa Barbara. So they got to relish this moment, and they can't afford to get intimidated just because this is kind of uncharted territory. And then they're facing a Pepperdine team that lost in straight sets to BYU. So... They're going to need to come motivated, and then Santa Barbara is going to need to come firing, fired up, out the gate. They have a lot of options offensively, but they got to like run their, their uh, offense to perfection. Both teams have to. And then for UC Santa Barbara, they got to... They really have to serve and pass well, and they also have to block pretty well as well. And they're, and they're also going to need to have a good defensive battle as well. They're going to need to dig the ball quite well because, like I said, they have had a lot of inconsistencies. It got to the point where they even had to throw their six foot four outside hitter at Libero. So it just be like that for the Gauchos. But to me, I think Santa Barbara ekes out a win over Pepperdine. I will eat lots of crow if I'm wrong, but... I think the Gauchos continue their miraculous season. And I want I want to see like a a new team into the NCAA semifinals. I know we've already got Hawaii there and I know we've got BYU there, but it's a good change of pace for the Big West Conference not having a team named Long Beach State. Nothing against Long Beach State because they are my school cuz I'm a student there. But I will also say this, we've kind of had Long Beach State, the past two NCAA men's volleyball tournaments winning it all. And they've made it to the semifinals. So there's that. Again, I, I'd like to see UC I like to see Long Beach State in the semifinals again, but unfortunately this just was not their year. And the fact that UC Santa Barbara being the the good feel good story is in the tournament for the first time this decade and for the first time in over 10 years is is quite astounding as well. So they really got to play their best, and they really got to show Pepperdine what they're really all about. But Pepperdine is not going to make it easy. I can tell you that much. Just because Pepperdine has a lot of good coaching experience. They've got player experience. Some of their players are from the past NCAA, or the last NCAA tournament that the Waves were in. So Pepperdine really has to has kind of has their work cut out. Both teams have their work cut out. But I think to me, I think Pepperdine has their work cut out the most just because they're facing a loaded UC Santa Barbara team. So there's that right there. So 
I got Santa Barbara squeaking it out in five sets. I think it goes five sets, and I think the Gauchos are able to to get the to win the points when it matters most. And who knows? Maybe UC Santa Barbara facing Hawaii in the semifinals could mean good fortune because remember, UC San Diego faced uh, Hawaii in in the Big West Conference semifinals where Hawaii unfortunately lost after they went 4-0. But again, we're not going to look too far ahead. So, And neither should Santa Barbara and uh, Pepperdine. So there's that. And, but to me, like I said la- uh, last time I did set point, I think no matter who makes it to the semifinals from either side, I think BYU and Hawaii are going to be in the championship. Hawaii has that, is basically, now they're the definition of the Chicago Cubs. Like, they haven't won an NCAA men's volleyball championship since I think the 2000s, and I think it got, eventually got vacated, which I'm not going to get too that too far ahead into that, but Hawaii is hungry for an NCAA men's volleyball championship, and they have the senior class to do it. They have Patrick Gassman, Colton Cowell, Rado Parapanov, who would not surprise me if he got the ABCA Player of the Year, so... Yeah, it's a big senior class, and this is probably those once-in-a-lifetime teams that Hawaii has. Kind of like Wisconsin, except Wisconsin didn't win at all, which is unfortunate for them, but it is what it is. A better example would be Kentucky, which they had a once-in-a-lifetime team, and they unfortunately, or they fortunately won it all. Um, But Hawaii men's volleyball is kind of in that same boat. They have a -a once-in-a-lifetime team. They have proven themselves time after time, and I think this is Hawaii's time to shine, or at least make the NCAA Finals again. So, there's that. But, I think this is going to be a fun NCAA Men's Volleyball Tournament. What I've been hearing is that they're... Oops. <laughs> well, egg type for a minute, y'all. Anyway... Sorry, I accidentally made a mistake. But for me, I think this NCAA Men's Volleyball Tournament is going to be very fun. We're going to be crowning a new champion. We're not going to have a repeat from last season. So there's that. But uh, I have been hearing that you can tune into the NCAA Men's Volleyball Tournament through the Big Ten Network and also through, I think, ESPNU. It doesn't say on here, which kind of sucks. But um, for the UC Santa Barbara Pepperdine matchup, doesn't say where the, uh, what's going to be, where it's going to be televised or whatnot. So, oh well. (laughs) Uh, That kind of sucks, but it is what it is. So, there's that for uh, for the NCAA Men's Volleyball Tournament. I actually would like to go over the N- the AVCA uh, Men's Volleyball uh, Award winners, if I can get to it right here. Okay, here, here it is, here it is, here it is, here it is. So, the NCAA... Men's Volleyball Division One and Two First Team All Americans. So, oh shoot! Wait a minute. Hold on. Wait. What the heck? This isn't it. Whoops. Sorry, y'all. Sorry, y'all. Stuff. Trying to find the actual thing. Okay. 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 It doesn't even give a link. What the frick? <laughs> and anyway, okay, I found it. So, anyway, so the AVCA and men's volleyball division one and two first team all American. So the first one is Ryan Conan of Lewis, which is no surprise. And then second is Randy Deweez of UC Santa Barbara. Third is Gabby Garcia Fernandez, last year's AVCA Player of the Year. And then the next one is David Gardini of BYU. And then 
Another one is Patrick Gaspin of Hawaii. Then we have Casey McGarry of UC Santa Barbara. Then we have Tyler Mitchum of Lewis. Then we have Rado Parupanov of Hawaii. Then we have Will Stanley of BYU. Then we also have rounding up the then we also have Gage Worsley, a first team All American. And we And that's it. That's it. So Ryan Conan, Randy DeWees, Gabby Garcia Fernandez, David Gardini, Patrick Gassman, Casey McGarry, Tyler Mitchum, Rado Paropanov, Will Stanley, and Gage Worsley are all first team All American. So congratulations to those players. So now for the second team AVCA second team All Americans. We have Cole Bogner of Penn State, Colton Cowell of Hawaii, Cal Fisher of Penn State, Alvaro Gimeno of NJIT. Kevin Calling of Lewis, Roy McFarland of UC Santa Barbara, Keenan Sanders of UC Santa Barbara, Spencer Wickens of Pepperdine, Brett Wildman of Penn State, and Austin Wilmot of Pepperdine as well. So, where are the honorable mentions? Oh, by the way, like I said, Bryce Dvorak was named the ABCA Men's Division One and Two Player of the Year in Men's Volleyball. So... Uh, where are the, the uh, honorable mentions? That is so weird. Why did they not post the honorable mentions? What the frick? Hmm. I'll find them eventually. I will, I am currently on, I'm currently on the, the whatchamacallit website as we speak. Eh, I'll, I'll, I'll search for it later, but there's pretty much your uh, All-Americans in terms of first team and second team. If I find the honorable mentions, I'll get, I'll put, I'll uh, announce them as well through here. But uh, those are your all, All-Americans. Kind of deserved. I hate, I, I'm glad someone that didn't make the NCAA tournament got an honor. And that was uh, Alvaro Gimeno of or Jimeno of NJIT. Like, it's there's always that one player that do, that's on a team that doesn't make the NCAA tournament that should go on there. And it really sucks because there's only a few... Uh, there's only a few spots, so... We'll see. It, it, it sucks, but... Uh, but it, it is what it is. Like, uh, at least we got a second team in an honorable mentions. If I could find the honorable mentions... Which is annoying, but unfortunately, there's no link posted, and I'll have to find it on my own time. But those are the all ABCA All Americans for the men's team, and then that's pretty much that for the NCAA men's volleyball portion of this show. So if I come across some more NCAA men's volleyball news, I will definitely let you all know. But we are going to take ourselves our first little breaky break. When we come back, we will be talking about some NCAA beach volleyball as the eight-team tournament has been announced, and it's going to be a fun time. And then I'll also break down the bracket as well. So keep it locked here on Set Point, here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. We'll be right back after a word from these other shows. Hey guys, it's Blake Henley, better known as H-Town Blake to some of you. Happy to announce that Faces Loader is back in full force. We'll be bringing that high heat every Tuesday night here on IE Sports Radio. So come home, get ready, dig into that batter's box, and see if you can chase that high heat, baby. So we'll be coming to you live with all the stats, all the rundowns, all the division rivalries, and every team that's going to make the playoff push to get to that one and only October and get to the pinnacle of what baseball is to hoist that commissioner's trophy when it's all said and done.
What's good, fight fans? It's your boy, Marcus Los Great. Here to give you what you want. Here to give you what you need. Yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> I'm coming to you live. Straight from your mama's basement with a crispy white tea. <laughs> we are coming to you live every Tuesday at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Powered by IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. And we are back with Set Point. You can check out all of our amazing shows here on IE Sports Radio. We have different ways you could listen to our shows. You, first and foremost, the most reliable way to listen to our shows is via Spreaker, which is kind of our bread and butter when it comes to doing our podcast. We also have some of our shows featured on iHeartRadio, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Podcast Addict, Tune In. We're even featured on YouTube. We have our YouTube account as well, which some of our shows all or or our shows always go to there as well. We're also featured on StreamYard as well, which is some cool times as well. So definitely do tune in to all of our shows. And also if you can follow iSports Radio on Twitter at iSports Radio. Follow them on Instagram at IE Sports Radio, and if you go on, and if you're on Facebook, go to the search bar, t- type in the word IE, then the word sports, and then the word radio, and then poof, you've got your IE Sports Radio page loaded up, and you can feel free to like us and follow us right there as well. So definitely do tune in to all of our shows. We have all kinds of shows, such as shows from Chicago. We have a baseball show. We have a football show. We have a basketball show. We have a show even dedicated to wine. We even have this show, which is dedicated to volleyball. And, yeah, definitely do check out our amazing lineup of shows and whatnot. The list goes on and on. So now let's get into segment number two for Set Point. So now let's jump on in to some NCAA Beach Volleyball action and... I will put a little disclaimer. I haven't been in fully paying attention to the NCAA beach volleyball season this year, just because the beach season is hasn't really been as I haven't really been focused fully much on that. Just because, well, obviously we've had NCAA indoor women's volleyball, and then we've also had NCAA men's volleyball happening as well. So, and it's mainly been NCAA women's volleyball, just because there are a lot of teams that are in that sport. So, so there's that right there. So, <laughs> but we have the NCAA beach volleyball tournament bracket released. It's only eight teams, which kind of sucks, but. I don't care, as long as we're getting some sort of volleyball. So, let us go down the list. Let's go from 8 all the way to number 1. So, the number 8 seed of the NCAA Beach Volleyball Tournament is... Okay, I won't do that every time. TCU. So, TCU is the last team in, so congrats to TCU. And the seventh seed for the NCAA Beach Volleyball Tournament is Cal Poly, which wound up winning the Big West Conference Tournament, defeating Hawaii in the championship match. Then the sixth seed is Stanford, making its first ever NCAA Beach Volleyball Tournament appearance, which is quite astounding. We gotta give Stanford a round of applause for that. So yeah, hard to believe that 
Stanford is only making its first ever NCAA tournament appearance now, as opposed to in the past. You would think they'd have a pretty good beach volleyball team, considering they have a great indoor women's volleyball team, and then their men's team, which I hope stays, will also is also great guns as well. So the fact that Stanford is making its first ever appearance in the NCAA beach tournament is awesome sauce. So Stanford is the sixth seed. The number five seed. The five seed is Loyola Marymount, a.k.a. LMU. LMU, I believe, is making its first ever NCAA tournament appearance. And they also won their first ever West Coast Conference Championship tournament. So that's absolutely amazing by the Lions. And they've kind of been under the radar. They haven't had that big breakout win. But who knows? Maybe they'll have it in the, in the NCAA tournament. So the number four seed is LSU. LSU, the number one team in the preseason polls, is the four seed. They are led by, Kier- I believe her, her name is Kirsten Nuss. Kirsten Nuss, I want to say. It's either Kirsten or Kristen. Regardless, the all-time winning, the all-time... Uh, The all-time uh, leader, yeah, Kristen Nuss. So, my bad. Oops. <laughs> so, yeah, Kristen Nuss, the all-time leader in in LSU beach volleyball wins and whatnot. So, cool beans right there. So, LSU is the number four seed. The number three seed of the NCAA beach volleyball tournament is Florida State. Now, Florida State has also had its fair share of being number one as they have had their ups and downs. One of their bad losses, however, came against FAU, where they lost in they lost three to two. I can't say they lost in five sets because all five matches are played and whatnot. So FSU to no to no surprise is the number three seed. I want to say they won their uh, tournament, and I'm and I'm ninety five percent certain they won their little tournament. I don't know what their turn their uh, conference is called because there is no ACC in beach volleyball and there is no SEC in beach volleyball. So I'll have to check out what their conference is named. But regardless, Florida State is the number three seed of the NCAA beach volleyball tournament. The number two seed of the NCAA beach volleyball tournament, and this comes to no one's surprise, doesn't come to my surprise, and it shouldn't come to anyone's surprise. It's USC, a.k.a. Southern California, not South Carolina, not Santa Clara, Southern California. So USC, as of recent, they were the number one team in in the AVCA polls. Unfortunately, they fell to UCLA in the Pac-12 tournament. They lost in the semifinals of the... Well, no, they, they lost in the... Well, yeah, it was considered the Pac-12 semifinals of the Pac-12 championship, or the Pac-12 tournament, but theoretically it's called the champions bracket, or the upper bracket. So, USC lost to UCLA in the upper bracket, 3-1, to one, and then they got bumped down to the contenders bracket, because, like I said, you can lose once in tournaments, but you can't lose twice. As USC actually beat Stanford in the semifinal semifinals of, or no, the finals of the contenders bracket. So USC and UCLA got to face one another in the Pac-12 championship finals as uh, championship finals, how redundant. Where UCLA was able to defeat USC 3-2. to two. And that is how USC got went from number one down to number two. But who knows, maybe that'll who knows, maybe that'll uh, humble USC. Because I don't think they have much to be sad about, just because it's tough to beat a team three or four times in one year, especially at this stage of the season. And USC still has some stud players on their team, like Audrey Norse and and Nicole Norse. I, I, I think that's... I think that's how her their last names are pronounced. Uh, I don't know if it's Nurse or Norse. Regardless, the twins from that went to Orange Lutheran High School and whatnot. So there's that for for USC beach volleyball. And I think USC is kind of the 
they're kind of the uh I don't think they're the hated favorite but they're the they're the team that no one wants to see win just because you know USC and whatnot. They also have another great dynamic duo as they have Haley Hallgreen and Haley Harward both of which are Haley <laughs> which is kind of funny and they're both partners and whatnot so cool stuff right there so so there's that for Long Beach State Beach Volleyball. And then the number one seed, which I kind of already mentioned, was UCLA. So UCLA was the number one seed after they beat number one USC, not once, but twice in the Pac-12 tournament. As the as the Bruins will look to defend their crown, last time there was an NCAA Beach Volleyball tournament, US, UCLA won the tournament 3 to nothing, and they did so over their rival USC. And this year, however, is going to be very tricky for UCLA to win because between seeds one through four, I think any of those teams could win. UCLA could win. USC could win. Florida State could win. And LSU could win because you, you can't count out any of those teams. And whichever team gets knocked into the contenders bracket, that team's going to be the most dangerous. And I hate to see one of those or three of those four teams not win this season, no matter who it is, even if it's UCLA, and I'm more of a USC guy. So for the NCAA Beach Volleyball Tournament, anyone can win in the NCAA Beach Volleyball Tournament between those four teams. That does not mean LMU, Stanford, or Cal Poly can make noise, or TCU. Like, I don't know much about TCU. All I know is that they suffered their first 5 to nothing loss this past or the pre yeah the pre- previous weekend where where they lost to Florida State and what and whatnot but for the most part TCU has been very competitive so I wouldn't underestimate TCU either but I think it's mainly going to be LMU LMU and probably Cal Poly as the dark horses but I think LMU is probably the the best dark horse. Of the bunch, like many could say, Florida State has been is the dark horse, but they've been number one. LSU has been number one. UCLA has been number one, and USC has been number one. Like LMU is more of a dark horse than any of those schools, and as well as as ah, as well as Cal Poly and Stanford and TCU. But any of those teams could probably win. But I think it's going to boil down to UCLA and USC. It's most likely got it. I'd be surprised if it wasn't USC and UCLA in the championship match. And that's between the contenders bracket versus the upper portion of the bracket and whatnot. So whoever whoever loses kind of is in going to be under a lot of pressure as... As basically, once you hit the contenders bracket... It's basically do or die there. Like once you're in the contenders bracket, it's either win or go home. And if you're not doing your best, then you're doomed. <laughs> but I could see like all those te- any like all those teams are going to be fighting for every point, fighting for every set. It's going to be absolutely banana loopies, and I think it's going to be a fun NCAA beach volleyball tournament. And I want to say this is the last tournament we're going to be seeing in. In uh, Alabama, it's goal. It's going to be the uh, whole tournament is being taken place in Gulf Shores, Alabama. As as I think they're changing uh, what you call it. They're changing locations next year. As I'm again, I'm I'm really looking. I, I haven't been paying attention to the beach volleyball scene this year, but I'm looking up to seeing where the where the uh, future tournaments are going to be. Held at, but regardless, this year's uh, tournament is going to be fun as heck, and I think it's the most wide open of of all the tournaments. And I really think it's going to be anyone's tournament. And I wouldn't be shocked if if uh, I wouldn't even be shocked if Florida State or LSU won, because both those teams are talented, and it would also mean that. And 
like I said, the depth of this tournament is very, very, very real. And again, when when it's tough to predict an NCAA champion, that's when you know this tournament is probably at its deepest and whatnot. So it's really going to be fun. So when I said, so unfortunately I was wrong <laughs> when it came to the NCAA beach of volleyball tournaments. Uh, so 2023, 2024, it's going to be held in Gulf Shores, Alabama. I think 2022 is also going to be held at Gulf Shores, Alabama. 2025 and 2026 is going to be held at Huntington Beach, which is really going to be fun. Like Huntington Beach, not Long Beach, Huntington Beach, Orange County, Surf City, USA. That's going to be very, 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 very fun right there. If I'm still living in Huntington, if I'm still living in the Orange County area, so we'll see how it goes. But for right now, I think this year has is the deepest beach volleyball tournament this has been. Again, I really feel bad for not fully keeping up with the NCAA beach volleyball scene, just because we have. You never want to take anything for granted just because you never know when it's going to get taken away. We all learned that lesson the hard way when it came to COVID. But this year's tournament's going to be so fun. I really am looking forward to this weekend. Like, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday is when the tournament begins. I want to say it goes first round, then, or it goes quarterfinals, semifinals. Finals, contenders bracket, and then the contenders bracket, and uh, and then the championship game is going to be on Sunday. So I gotta look that up through the uh, NCAA site. I really, again, I, I wasn't really like fully prepared when it comes to this, but I, I haven't really like, I don't really fully. I'm not like the one to like fully pay attention to the beach scene, and and here it is, here it is, here it is. So day one, so it's basically the quarterfinal. Here's how it goes. So it's an early start game. Holy crud! Like the tournament starts very early, like 6 a.m. on Friday, Friday, uh, May seventh is when the tournament starts, and that starts UCLA TCU. And then, but then again, that is 9 a.m. Eastern time. And then, then after that is, and then after that is the 7 a.m. matchup for the Pacific time. Then we've got 8 a.m. and then 9 a.m. And then the semifinals in the champions bracket gets underway as the semifinals starts in the champions bracket or the upper bracket starts at 12 p.m. Pacific time. And then the Second one falls at 1 p.m. Pacific time. And then the elimination bracket starts at 10 a.m. and 11 a.m. So the elimination bracket gets underway after the uh, upper bracket. So I like how they call it the elimination bracket. I just call it the do or die bracket or the contenders bracket. I think elimination bracket is a little too intense, but to each his own. So basically the, the next day... May 8th, the elimination bracket gets underway. The first matchup starts at 10 a.m. in the elimination bracket, and then the second matchup begins at 10 a.m. That's the elimination bracket semifinals. And then the upper portion bracket, or the champions portion bracket, gets underway at 1 p.m. Pacific time. So whoever wins that that matchup automatically goes to the NCAA championship, while the loser plays in the elimination bracket championship as well as they face at off at 2 30 pacific time which is 5 30 p.m eastern time and whatnot so whoever and whoever wins in the elimination bracket finals goes on to the ncaa championship match where they face the winner of the champions bracket and like i said it could be anyone in that champions bracket or the elimination bracket if I had to predict who is going to be in the championship match, I think it's going to be USC and UCLA. I definitely think it's going to be those two. I don't know who's going to be in what which bracket, but I think the Trojans and Bruins are both playing at a high level. I would not count out LSU. I would not count out Florida State. And I definitely, definitely would not count out 5 through 8, which would be LMU, Stanford, 
Cal Poly and TCU. Those teams didn't get this far for nothing. Like TCU got in as an at-large team, Stanford got in as an at-large team, and then USC obviously got in as an at-large team too. But but uh, USC has been ranked in the top five throughout the entire season. So there's that right there. But regardless, it's going to be a fun tournament. And then also keep an eye out for Cal Poly, too. Cal Poly, even though they lost players to graduation a few years ago, or a couple of years ago, they have some studs on their team as well. And then, I, and then also, uh, LSU got in as an at-large team as well. I, I forgot to mention LSU. So the at-large teams were TCU, LSU, Stanford, and USC. The other four teams won their conference tournament. UCLA won the Pac-12 tournament. Cal Poly won the Big West Conference tournament. LMU won the West Coast Conference tournament. And Florida State won their tournament, which is basically a mixture of the SEC and the ACC. I'm just going to call it the Power 5 tournament. (laughs) Uh, I'm so bad when it comes to remembering these conference names. Uh... (laughs) But that's pretty much that for the beach volleyball tournament. Like I said, it all begins at 6 a.m. Pacific time, which is 9 a.m. Eastern time. So I'm very excited for this tournament. I'm even going to set my alarm. I just got to get everything out of the way school-wise. So there's that. But that's going to do it for today's episode of Set Point. I know we start a little later, but that is all right. And I know we're going to end a little bit later than normal, but... That's pretty much going to be it, because this is the last full week of the NCAA volleyball season, in terms of Division One, of course. I don't know the whole th- shebang when it comes to Division Two and Division Three. I know the NAIA championship just got, just got completed. On that note, I actually want to give a shout-out to Brad Rostratter, former Set Point guest and Vanguard men's volleyball coach as he was named the NAIA coach of the year which is absolutely amazing he took Vanguard all the way to the NAIA semifinals and unfortunately the Lions lost to the dreaded I forget the team the Arizona team I'm probably going to kick myself when I for, when I forget this this team's name. But uh, regardless, Vanguard got all the way to to the NCAA Men's Volleyball Championship, where unfortunately they lost to Benedictine. That's the name. How did I not? I, I was thinking it was some type of egg, and then it's like Benedictine. That's the name. So. Unfortunately, Vanguard lost in the semifinals of the NAIA tournament to the dreaded Benedictine. However, it was still an amazing season for Vanguard. They won their first ever Golden State Athletic Conference Championship, and they were, again, to get all the way to the semifinals. And Vanguard isn't even that old. They're only two years old and as a men's volleyball program, and yet they got all the way to the semifinals. Unfortunately, they're, they're ju- they just have not been able to get over that hump that is Benedictine, but they will get over that hump eventually. Like, having Vanguard as a men's volleyball program is great, especially in Orange County, because now it gives, t- it gives players an alternative option outside of junior college to attend a four-year university, and it basically gives them leeway to stay close to home. And it's really fun, honestly. So good stuff for Vanguard and good stuff for Brad Rostratter. I think he's got a great foundation going on there. So good job to him. So what is so back to the last week of the NCAA volleyball season. So this is the last full week of any everything NCAA volleyball wise when it comes to like actual gameplay. At, after Sunday That's it for NCAA Volleyball. And that's going to pretty much do it for the NCAA Volleyball season in general. And it might be the end of the... It might be the end of Season 1. And I don't know what's going to happen after Season 1 of Set Point. Like, I definitely want to keep Set Point going. I don't know what we're going to do when it comes to, like, guests. Like, maybe I'll get guests wrangled up, but I can't really fully 
promise that just because I've had a lot of guests on as we speak and we don't know how busy everyone's going to be and I don't know how uh, how busy I'm going to be when it comes to uh, the summer. But I want to keep set point going. Like, I ain't going to stop. I really am not. But even though the NCAA volleyball season is coming to a close, it does not mean set point's coming to a close. We got plenty more volleyball around the world. We have 3C2A volleyball. And I actually do want to touch upon something before I sign off. So 3C2A men's volleyball will not have a championship, unfortunately. Um, I guess the 3C2A voted that there weren't going to be enough schools for the for the for the three C two A men's volleyball championships to be had, so it is what it is. Like if teams are opting out because their conferences are doing so and whatnot, then so be it. And but there is gonna be a conference tournament between in the Orange Empire Conference, and that's gonna consist of Orange Coast College, Fullerton College, Irvine Valley College, Golden West College, and Santiago Canyon College. The head coach of Irvine Valley and Orange Coast have been past guests here on set point, so that's going to be a fun time. I really want to go to that so I could bring you all live coverage. Like, it would be so fun if I did. Like, it all depends, though. Like, the Orange Empire Conference isn't until uh, for another two weeks, so I have to factor in that as well, so... Let me just pull it up on my handy dandy phone on when it's going to start. Yeah, so the OEC, the Orange Empire Conference Champions play in round is Wednesday, May 19th, and then the semifinals are on Friday, May 21st, and then Wednesday, May 26th is the championship. Kind of a weird. It's kind of weird that how they uh, have it, considering that they don't even know where it's going to be at. Even though it could, there could be home court advantage. It's not entirely sure. Maybe it'll be at a remote area. I'm not sure. I'll have to find out more information. Maybe this week. I promise you all, I will find out more information when it comes to this. But it's kind of weird that they are not having the tournament on a Saturday or something. Maybe they just can't because maybe there's other sports happening. Like, I haven't seen too many 3C2A sports happening, other than, like, baseball and softball, maybe swimming. Like, this whole season when it comes to COVID has just been so wonky. Like, I don't even think we got a football season, which really sucks. I know they there was, like, scrimmages, but overall, this year has just been so weird when it comes to 2020. And luckily, we were even able to get, like, a sports season when it comes to men's volleyball. Heck, even high school sports are lucky, which I'll be discussing that as well, especially for California. I don't really want to go fully in depth on that because no one wants to, not everyone all over the world wants to hear me talk about high school volleyball in California, but we'll see. At the end of the year, we'll, I'll for sure be giving out the national rankings and what it means and whatnot because there are still some top tier teams in California that's nationally ranked. So. I'll be going over that in the near future. I know the high school boys volleyball count. Yeah, the high school boys volleyball season is over in terms of the regular season in two weeks. So they have this week, and then they have next week, and then they have playoffs the following week, which will be the first round or the wild card round, then the first round, then the, then the quarterfinals, and then they also have the semifinals. The no, they have the quarterfinals the following round, or the following week, and then they have the semifinals on Friday, which is so weird. And then they have, or no, they have the semifinals on Saturday. Regardless, I'm looking too far ahead, and we're not going to get into high school volleyball until like the last few weeks of May. So, set point is still going to be going on, and I ain't going to stop this train until unless we really got nothing going on. But it all depends on if school continues to pile up because I think this week if I'm not mistaken, is the last week of, like, lectures and whatnot. So, and I'm still trying to pass to make the grade when it comes to my classes. And I'm almost done. If I can pass both my classes, I can graduate 
from Long Beach State, but y'all don't want to really hear my sob story or whatnot. <laughs> but that's going to do it for Set Point, everybody. Thank you all for tuning in. Shout out to the chat room, Adam Karnick for tuning in. Shout out to Courtney Harden for tuning in. I appreciate the both of you tuning in. And for those of you listening on the live stream, I appreciate you. For those of you that are listening as a podcast, I also appreciate you. Without any further delay, it is time, ladies and gentlemen, to drop the beat, because I'm about to dip like a banana in chocolate. You feel me? Once again, thank you all for tuning in to Set Point. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you for keeping up with me through this crucial, tough, long NCAA volleyball season. We got through the NCAA women's volleyball season, and now we are two tournaments away from getting through the full NCAA volleyball season, and that'll be awesome. I've never had set point go through an NCAA women's volleyball season, an NCAA men's volleyball season, and an NCAA beach volleyball season. Last year, we were supposed to have that, but unfortunately, COVID kind of got in the way, but we are healing, and we are pretty much back to full strength, or at least to the new normal. Regardless, do your part to slow the spread, get vaccinated, wear a mask, stay six feet apart, don't be a dummy, which would ruin everything, get everything locked down again. You know what it is. But thank you all for tuning in. I greatly appreciate you. For everyone here at iSports Radio, this is Taryn Rodriguez signing off. Thank you to our sponsors, Legacy Financial and Southern California Warriors. Thank you to you, the listeners, for tuning in. And for sure this time, I will see you on Friday for the SoCal Supreme Sports Show. Peace, y'all.